2.3 is using scatter plots for real life data. All right, so a scatter plot is just a set of data um, that are just ordered pairs. They're just random points on your graph. So a scatter plot can look something like this, where not all of them form a line, but maybe some of them are pretty close to a line. Okay. A line of fit is a line that closely approximates the set of, set of data, and then the prediction equation is the equation for that line of fit. Okay, so your calculator can find like the best line of fit. It runs it through like every single pair of points and finds the, the line that the points are closest to. Does that make sense? So like a line of fit, fit would not be there. Do you guys see how a lot of points are not on the, along that line? But it would probably be right kind of in the middle. Okay, so the calculator can quickly find um, the best line of fit. But we're not going to do that. We're going to do ours by hand. So we're not going to get like really in-depth with um, lines of fit. Okay, so number one, so it says the table below shows the approximate percentage of students from Indianapolis who sent applications to Indiana University in various years since 2000. So make a scatter plot of the data. Okay, so you should always label your axes. So on the bottom, I'm going to say years since 2000. That's my X. And then my Y is going to be the, the percent, um, so the percent of students from Indianapolis. All right, so in 2000, let's say 20% um, applied. So we have, notice how we're only going up to 20, and our numbers are all below 20. So you should always think about the best way to scale your um, graph. So if the highest point is 20, let's think about it. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 tick marks. Yeah, we can go by 2, exactly. So we're going to call this 2, 4, and so on. All right, so, whoops, I wrote 10, but that should be 20. All right, so we have 0, 20. We're up here at the top. We have 3, 18. So how about the Ys? What do we want to go by for, go by for the Ys? 3s, because we already have 3s, right? So let's go ahead and do 3, 6, 9. You could spread it out a little bit more, um, or you can keep it really close together. All right, so we have 3, 18. We have 6, 15, um, 9, 15, and 12, 14. So you can see that it's not making a perfect line. Like all of these points are not on the same line, right? So you can come up with different lines of fit. So if you just take a ruler, I'll kind of show you up here, and you're like, okay, well, what if I connect the first and the last? And then you say, well, how many points are off the line then? It looks like at least two, right, are off the line. Um, and then you say, well, what if I connect these two points? That one's probably not a good line of fit. Do you guys get it? So you kind of play around with it and try to figure out the best line of fit. Um, usually on the homework, I say use the first and the last. Okay, so we're going to use the first one and the last one. So how well does it fit the, the data? It fits pretty well, right? There's only a, Is there only one point that's off the line? Are you guys using a nice straight edge? So only one point off. So we'll say only one to two points off the line. Yeah, Eric? Uh, mm -hmm. On both sides, yeah. So ideally what you would have is if you have your line of fit and there's two points that are off, they're kind of the same distance off the line on both sides. And that's what your calculator will kind of find for you. So sometimes your line of fit is kind of in between, right? Like maybe it doesn't go through two of your points. Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll just do the first and the last because we are doing it by hand, we're not using a calculator. All right, so make a prediction equation. So if I'm using the first and the last point, so I have 0, 20, and I have 12, 14, I want to find the slope and then the y-intercept. Do I have one of those already? Do you guys see how this is the y-intercept? Okay, so we have the y-intercept already. So our slope is going to be 14 minus 20 over 12 minus 0. So we get negative 6 over 12, which is negative 1 half. So our prediction equation is y equals negative 1 half x plus the y-intercept, which is 20. So if we didn't have that y-intercept, then you'd have to do the point-slope form, or you'd plug in temporarily for x and y to find b, right? 
All right, so it says, what's the slope and the y-intercept indicate? So what, how about the y-intercept? What does that indicate, like, in this situation? What do you think? Look at your original data. It was the most in this case, but what about in 1990, right? Maybe there was more in 1990 than we know. So what does it represent? So in the year... 2000, this was the number of students, the percent of students from Indianapolis who applied to IU. Okay, so that's what the um, 20 represents. So it's the original percent of students who applied to IU from Indy in the year 2000. So when I say original, what I'm meaning is in the year 2000. All right, how about the negative 1 half? What does that represent? Yeah, so it's like the rate of decrease, right? So we're decreasing by negative 1 half um, every single year. So that is the rate of decrease. All right, and then predict the percent in 2015. So in 2015, what would you plug in for x? 15, right? So we're going to plug in 15 into our prediction equation. So I get negative 1 half times 15 plus 20. So negative 7.5 plus 20 is 12.5. So we would predict that there were 12.5, so 12.5 percent of Indianapolis students applied to IU. Okay. Does that make sense? So you find two points, create a prediction equation, and then make a guess based on that. All right, so number two. So it says the table shows the number of calories burned per hour by a 140-pound person running at various speeds. Make a scatter plot and draw a line of fit. Okay, so we have the speed and we have calories per hour. So we're going to make the speed our x and our calories per hour our y. So it's actually okay if you do flip those, um, but your equation will be different than your friends, right? Your slope will end up being like the reciprocal. So I usually do the first data set as x, the second one as y. So we have a speed and we have calories per hour. And our speed is 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. So if you want to go by twos, you could do that. You could say, okay, this is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and so on. You could do that. Or you could go by every two spaces represents 1, right? Whatever you want to do to fill that space. All right, another thing that you guys can do, so you don't have to erase this, so I'll, I'll write it, but, is if you're starting at 5, so you don't have anything until 5, you can do like a little squiggle, and then you can start your data at 5, and then you could go as many as you want, so 6, 7, 8, so that would be a way to do it as well. And same for the Y's, you don't want to start at 0 for the Y's when your first one is 512, so that's when I would do a little squiggle there too, right? And that means that you're cutting off part of the, the graph. So we've cut off part of that. We can't see it. So then if I go from 512 to 862, maybe I want, um, I don't know, let's try every two is 50. So let's go with 500, 550, 600, 650, 700, 750, 800, 850. That pretty good. Go 500, the next mark is 550. So I will say if you do the little squiggle thing and cut off part of your graph, sometimes it looks like you have a certain y-intercept and you don't really have that y-intercept. Because notice it's been cut off here. So my y-intercept would actually be kind of further to the left, right? So don't assume that you have a certain y-intercept um, when you cut off the graph. All right, so if I have 5 comma 512, so we'll say right in there, we have 6 comma 638. 
we have 7, 734. And we have 8, 862. Okay, so it looks pretty good. It looks like a, almost like a line. So you can pick any point. So like I said, I think on the homework I had you pick the first and the last. So let's pick 5, 512 and 8, 862. So if those points are like way off, like if your last one was like down here, then don't pick that point, right? Um, but if they look like it's on the line, then we'll pick those first and last. So we have m equals 862 minus 512 all over 8 minus 5. So I get 349 over, wait, that's not right, 862. <laughs> I should probably be able to do this in my head, right? Uh, 50 over 3. And then this time I don't have the y-intercept. What did I do? 350? Oh, yeah, I don't know how to do it. Oh, yeah, 350 over 3. My fingers are not working. All right, so 350 over 3. And then I'm going to plug it into um, my y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 because I want to find my um, prediction equation, right? So I have the slope, 350 over 3. And then I'm going to plug in 5, 512. And it, you could plug in either one. You'd get the same equation. So I'm going to have 350 over 3x. And then I have 350 over 3 times negative 5. And then I'm going to add 512 over. So I just did this all on my calculator. And I have negative 71.3333333 repeating. Remember, you can use that, that fraction button. Do you guys remember you have a fraction button on your calculator? So you have math and then fraction, and enter. So I end up getting minus 214 over 3. Okay, which was like 71.33, negative 71.333. All right, so for part C, it says, if a 140-pound woman runs 5.5 miles per hour, about how many calories will she burn in an hour? Okay, so this is 5.5 miles per hour. Okay, so what is that? Is that an x value or a y value? It's x, right? We put speed as our x value. So we're saying x is equal to 5.5. So we're going to plug that into our equation. To get y. Okay. So I do 350 over 3 times 5.5 minus 214 over 3. And so my calculator is giving me 570.3 repeating. So she's losing about 570 calories. Okay. So what if I said how much does she burn for 3 hours? Right? Then you would take that and you multiply by 3. Does it make sense? Because our y value was calories per hour. Good, do we understand that? It's pretty easy, it's not that bad.